Holy Spirit will be able to understand it. So we're in Romans uh, chapter 13, uh, verses 11 through 14. Should be about uh, page 127 in your pew Bible. If you need a Bible, there are plenty of Bibles in the back. I, sometimes I look out and, and we get ready to read and I see uh, folks and uh, absolutely if you're on your phone or your tablet or whatever, they're great, but, but please, please, please have, have the word open on your lap in some, some format uh, as we go through. This is, uh, again, this is probably the most important thing you're going to do all week. Uh, and let's get into the Word of God. So let's, uh, let's go to uh, Romans chapter 13, verses 11 through 14. Do this, knowing the time, that it is already the hour for you to awaken from sleep. For now salvation is nearer to us than when we believed. The night is almost gone, and the day is near. Therefore, let us lay aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us behave properly as in the day, not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual promiscuity and sensuality, not in strife and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh in regard to its lusts. This is the word of the Lord. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for your word, O oh Lord God. We desire not to just be hearers of the word, but doers of the word. But we cannot do that without your enabling, O oh Lord. So we pray that you would help us right now. Help us to understand deeply what it is that uh, the Apostle Paul is saying to us, that you're, what you're saying to us in your word uh, this morning as is preached, O oh Lord God. And we pray that it would penetrate these hard hearts of ours, O oh Lord God, that it would be planted deeply in us and that it would bear much fruit, O oh Lord, for your glory. Lord, we cannot do this apart from you. So by your Holy Spirit, move in us, O oh Lord God, that uh, this would not just be an academic exercise, but this would have an eternal effect, not just on us, but on all those around us, O oh Lord God, by the power of your Holy Spirit. It's in Christ's name we pray. Well, good morning. Welcome to Grace Community Church again. We are, as Chris read for us, going through Romans 13, the end of this chapter, and we are learning a lot for our own lives, I pray, that you are gleaning from Romans and applying this to your particular situation in life, and good things are happening in you. That is the goal. So here are a few questions from this section. What are these verses referring to when Paul admonishes us to wake up? To, to what things are we to wake up from? Is the apostle addressing unbelievers because he says salvation is near and if you're already saved, we wondered, is, is he talking to, to those that aren't saved? And then finally, is Christ, if Christ is already in me, what does it mean to put on Christ? I, I thought I had already done that. So again, we need to work through these things and, and figure out how they apply to our own lives. We're in the second section of Romans on living the transformed life, started in chapter 12. Uh, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That's what we need. We need to take all this theology that Paul gave us in the first 11 chapters and let that filter its way down to our hands and feet so that we can be doers of the word and not just hearers. We really haven't done anything if God's word isn't changing the way we live, the way we treat people, the way we think about God. That is the purpose of our Bible lessons. And so let's, let's let that happen today in us. I, I did want to say we're, we're changing the order of our Sunday service starting today so we're not going to pray twice at the end of service and have a closing song we'll do the sermon here and then i'll close us off in prayer and we're going to go eat some delicious food and have some great <laughs> fellowship so that's kind of the new um, condensed version of grace community church sunday service So our sermon for today is entitled, Put on the Lord Jesus Christ. We're going to try to unpack that and, and do that 
for our own lives. Here's our outline. Paul tells us in verse 11, wake up. He says the day of salvation is near, nearer than to put on the armor of light and put on Christ and finally make no provision for the flesh. So here we go. Here is our first admonition to wake up. And he says in verse 11 again, it is already the hour for you to awaken from sleep. And then in 1 Thessalonians 5, 6, the Apostle Paul says, let us not sleep as others do, but let us be alert. And then from the book of Revelation, the Lord speaking he says, wake up and strengthen the things that remain which were about to die. I want to unpack that last one there in Revelation 3 because it has an interesting context. It was written to the church in Sardis. And the whole context of that statement that we just read is here. To the church in Sardis write, I know your deeds, that you have a name, that you are alive but you are dead. Wake up and strengthen the things that remain which were about to die. So here is a church that perhaps began well, but had fallen asleep in their spiritual duties, a real church written to by the Apostle John in the first century. Here is a little background on this church. Sardis stood atop a 1,500-foot plateau with sheer cliffs on three sides. King Croesus of Lydia made Sardis his capital, and because it had cliffs on three sides, he only had guards on one side of the, uh, the mountaintop. Well, that proved to be a detriment and fa a fatal flaw. In 549, the Persian army scaled the cliffs and entered the city while the people slept, including the king. 300 years later, the armies of Antiochus the Great captured the city in the same way. So Sardis became, and Christ is using it here, speaking to the city of, of uh, Sardis in the first century, because the, this city was synonymous for those who were overcome or conquered while they were asleep. And now he is applying that to the church. This is the history of your city. And this is the way that you Christians are living, he says to them. So uh, another analogy here. We know that on December 7th, 1941, a horrible event took place and the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor. There was a, a Japanese admiral, Yamamoto, and in his diary after that bombing, he wrote, I fear... All we have done is awaken a sleeping giant, and that um, occurred. America woke up out of our sleep and our slumber, trying to stay out of the war, and um, then engaged the battle. And so our, our question is, my question is to the church, <laughs> is the United States asleep again? Is the Christian church in, in America asleep? The Lord says to the church, wake up and strengthen the things that remain which are about to die. So Paul's warning is against spiritual slumber. In particular, we can boil it down to just the, the ABCs of Christianity, the things that you and I should be doing in our the exercise of our our Christian lives, basic stuff, reading the Bible, praying, coming to, to Christian fellowship, coming to church on Sunday, sharing our faith. These are just basic stuff. But the problem is, is that the church in America has, has fallen asleep in these things. And I, I had uh, some slides with all kinds of pie charts and good stuff like that. But if you look at the, the statistics, of those who call themselves Christians in this country, and, and whether all of them are Christians or not, God knows, but a very small portion of those who call themselves Christians, number one, think that they even need to go to church, um, read their Bible more than 
once or twice a year. I mean, you can search these, Google these numbers yourself because Google's never wrong. <laughs> or share their faith with anybody. Do, do you know, and we were just talking about this in one of our other fellowships, this country, the United States of America, used to be the greatest missionary sending country in the world. And second place wasn't even close. England was probably second. But the United States used to be a light, sending out missionaries all over the world. Do you know that third world countries are sending missionaries to the United States now? We're a mission field. Those countries are looking at America and saying, they've lost their way. Here are little, little church in third world countries. They don't have all the trappings and, and expensive programs and so forth that we have. But they're alive. They're passionate about Christ. People walk, in some cases, a couple hours to get to their church. And they look at the church in America and they see what we're doing. We've fallen asleep, guys. Let's not be part of that demographic. We, we can't affect all the other churches, but we can have an effect on, on our church, on your church. It really hurts my heart when people say, this is Pastor Steve's church. It's not my church. It's your church. Take ownership. Get involved. Be a part of the body life here, what God is doing at Grace Community Church. There's some good stuff going on, and we need your help. We have a vacation Bible school coming up. If you have time, we could use your help. We have all kinds of needs around the church that need to be addressed. We need your help. We need you most of all to, to take what you're learning here on Sunday. This sounds a little self-serving, and you can dismiss it if you like. Perhaps it is. I, I spend a fair amount of time putting together outlines and devotions in your bulletin for you to read uh, a summary and other verses that you can read after the, the sermon throughout the week to reinforce the things that we're, we're talking about here. Here's just, I mean, they're not the best. They're pretty amateurish by any measure. But there's some, the, the, the value of those is they point you to some other verses in the Bible to reinforce what we're talking about here. It'll just help you. Do something. Read God's word every day. Talk to him every day. How many times can we say that? I, I don't want to just harp on you. You guys know these things. And I know you love the Lord, but we're all human, and we can, we can fall asleep at the wheel. And I think... The Christian church in America is guilty of that. So we're admonished to wake up from such complacency and, and actively, actively, vigorously live for Christ. I mean, all the metaphors in the New Testament, especially about our sanctification, run with endurance. That, that, that indicates some vigorous activity in your Christian life. How are you running? Verses 11 and 12, Paul says, For now salvation is nearer to us than when we believe. That's a curiosity, because he's speaking to Christians in the church in Rome. And then in verse 12, The night is almost gone and the day is near. What day is that? So we, we kind of need to figure this out. Your salvation is spoken of in three different ways, in three different tenses. There's a past aspect to it, a present aspect, and a future aspect. The past aspect, if, if you are truly born again, there was a day that you first believed God, by his mighty Holy Spirit, regenerated your spiritually dead heart and gave you the faith to believe. And then you cried out in some way, and in your own words, Lord Jesus, I need you. Come into my life. 
help me, save me. But that couldn't have happened unless God had been the first cause of all of those things. That was your justification. When you first believed in Christ, justification is a forensic term in Greek, and it's a declaration by the, the Supreme Court judge of the universe who declares the believer on the basis of faith uh, to be justified. And the imputed righteousness of Christ is, is given to the believer on the basis of faith. You are counted righteous because Christ lives in you. And that, by the way, is the way the only way that you would go to heaven. It's not by your practice. You know, even today, after all these years later, since you believed, your practice is not perfect. God, knowing that we still have a long way to go, he said, I'm not going to base it on works. It's by grace through faith alone that you are saved. But it's not as though works are irrelevant. We're not saved by works. We're saved for works. Works are not the root of your salvation. They are the fruit of your salvation. They're the natural overflow of an already saved heart. That's the past aspect of your salvation called justification. But now there's a present aspect. The Bible calls that sanctification. Justification happens at a point in time. When you first believed, you were born again. And you were changed. But now sanctification is not a point in time, but a lifelong process whereby the uh, saved person grows in in his salvation, grows in his faith, grows in righteousness even. We're becoming more Christ-like. And that process will never be finished in this life. Um, your dying breath, you'll still be um, imperfect, but you're not going to heaven based upon a perfect record, perfect practice. You're going based upon the perfect righteousness of Christ imputed to your account, received on the basis of your faith in him. That can't change. There is yet a final aspect to our salvation and we don't always think about this but the Bible talks about a redemption that is yet to happen that is to say the redemption of our bodies Paul says in Romans 8 23 we already went through these verses we ourselves having the first fruits of the spirit grown within ourselves waiting eagerly this is something future for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our body. One day, the trumpet will sound, and the dead in Christ shall rise. And we will put on, as you read in 1 Corinthians 15, the end of that chapter, the corruptible will put on incorruption, right, Keith? Incorruption will be incorruptible, which means you will be unable to sin anymore in your new glorified. Yeah, that's worth. That's better than BBS. (laughs) And you, we will. We have to put on new glorified bodies because we're going to live with Christ, face to face fellowship with the Lord in a new glorified heaven and earth. Whoa. And whatever you think that's like, you're not even close. No eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind can conceive. I can conceive of a lot. (laughs) Whatever you can can conceive of concerning the eternal state, you're not even close. It's so much better than that. Three aspects, three tenses three parts even, we could say, of our salvation. And there is a future part, which is our glorification. So he says salvation is drawing near. That is to say our bodily redemption. We're like, well, when is that? We don't know. 
but it's going to happen, and it's closer than it was yesterday. It's closer than when you first believed. And so the day is drawing near. One day Christ is going to break through the clouds and bring an end to all of this. And we're going to get a new heaven and a new earth, it says in 2 Peter 3, in which righteousness dwells and only righteous people can live there. We don't know the day, Jesus said. He's not going to tell us. He said, it's curious because he says that not even the Son of Man knows. In his humanity, he honestly did not know. Of course, same time we know he had two natures, uh, the God nature and humanity in his deity, of course. He is om was, is, always has been omniscient, and yet God <sighs> caused his son and Christ submitting to the will of the Father during his three-year ministry here on earth. He would only uh, do those things that he was told to do by the Father. He would only say those things that God wanted him to say. And here's, here's the crazy part of this. This God-man would only know in his humanity uh, the things that God wanted him to know at that moment. Yeah, don't, don't try to figure that out or you'll hurt yourself. <laughs> so the, the point of this, why didn't he just tell us? He's coming at the end of your VBS. It's going to be the best VBS ever. And in the closing ceremony, he's coming back. He wouldn't tell us because he knows you. You're such a procrastinator. Big time. I mean, when I was in, at the Air Force Academy, we'd have these ginormous term papers to write. I know. And they took so much research and effort and time. And, and, and of course, being good students, we would start months in advance. Yeah. All of that. Yeah. <laughs> what did we do? Well, well, we couldn't do it in one night, so we pulled two all-nighters. <laughs> and um, you wrote some of your best stuff. Deprived of sleep. You thought of things you just people don't think about because of your lack of sleep. But we're procrastinators. So God wants you and me to live in readiness. L listen, Christ might not come back today or 100 years from now or 1,000 years from now. I think it's going to be way sooner than that. But you might go, you will go to see him within a few decades. And you need to be ready either way, whether he comes to see us or you go to see him, it's the same thing. You're going to stand before the Lord. And the Bible says over and over again, there's a judgment seat, a Bema seat, that Christians appear before too. Not to determine where you're going to spend eternity, but to judge our works for degrees of reward. The Bible teaches that. Sproul used to say, I, this is my favorite quote now, what you do today matters forever. So make every moment count. You're living for Christ, and that's what he's going to reward, is, is your effort, albeit imperfectly, to live for him, live for Jesus Christ, that you might hear those words, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your master. Jesus said, look up, because your redemption is drawing nigh. That's just the way old-timers said, near. It just sounds better. Then he says in verses 12 through 14, put on the armor of light and put on Christ. So let's unpack those two statements. He says, therefore, let us lay aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. So there's a picture here in these verses of a person who's awakening out of their sleep at the end of the night. He's considering the, the things of the day that are ahead of him, and he's putting on his clothes. That's kind of the 
metaphor that Paul is employing in these verses. And he says, lay aside the deeds of darkness. That's your old self. And put on the armor of light. In Ephesians 5.8, the apostle says, you were formerly darkness. Not you were just in darkness, but you were part of the darkness. You were formerly darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of the light. This has to be a way that we walk, the way that we live. Walking uh, implies continuous forward action. Walk this way as children of the light. Be a light in this world. We've said it more than a few thousand times. There is no other light but Christ in you. There's no light in the man-made religions of the world. There's no light in modern psychology and philosophy. But you, Christian, Jesus said, you are the light of the world. And we need to walk that way because you're the only light. Ephesians 5, 9, the next verse says, For the fruit of the light consists in all goodness and righteousness and truth. What's that armor made of? This is it. Goodness. The goodness of God. His righteousness. Truth. Do you walk in truth? Are you a man or woman of integrity? These things characterize the true believer. And we need to walk in these things. Jesus said, you are the light of the world. But if the light in you is darkness, oh, how great is the darkness. Then he says, put on Christ. Earlier in Galatians 3.27, he says, all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. So we're already clothed with Christ. That happened when we first believed So what does this mean to to put on Christ? Again, two aspects of salvation. You who were baptized, when did that happen? Well, we can talk in terms of water baptism, but there's only one baptism, and water is just a symbol of the true baptism, which is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit comes into the life of the believer the moment you believed you're given the fullness of the spirit in fact that spirit was already in you regenerating your heart giving you faith to believe and baptizing you and then at some later date after your your salvation you you went to your pastor and told him i i need to be baptized i'm a believer now and that that water symbol of the work of the holy spirit but that's that was the past aspect of our salvation. We were justified when we believed. Uh, there, there's a good picture of this in um, the story of Lazarus. Lazarus was the brother of Mary and Martha, and he was sick. And I love the commentary there in John's Gospel. Jesus was told, and Lazarus and Mary and Martha were good friends of Jesus. And word came to Jesus, he was in another town, that Lazarus was very sick. And it says in so many words that that Jesus procrastinated and he waited another couple days before he went. You think, well, I thought he knew everything. Didn't he know Lazarus was deathly ill and that he was going to die? Of course he did. And that's why he waited. Because his purpose was not to heal a sick man, but to raise a dead man. That those people might see that he is, he was, he always shall be who he said he was, the Messiah, the anointed one. Endowed with a power even to raise the dead. And so he gets there. Lazarus is dead. Mary and Martha are unconsolable, inconsolable. One of those two. Um, They were crying. (laughs) 
And what does Mary say? You know, if you had been here, he wouldn't have died. You could have saved him. And Jesus has this dialogue with this poor woman. Do you believe in the resurrection? Yes, yeah, well, I believe at the end of the age, you know. And Jesus says, I am the resurrection. Resurrection is not a principle. It's a person. Jesus Christ is the resurrection. And he says, roll away the stone from the tomb. It had been four days, and there was quite a protest when he gave the order. In the King James is the best way to read this. They said, Lord, by now he stinketh. <laughs> That's what I feel like when I'm scooping up after my dog. <laughs> this stinketh. But by the Lord's commandment, they do it. And Jesus utters these words, Lazarus, come forth! Life surged back into that dead man's body. He was wrapped up like a little mummy. That's the way they buried their dead in burial cloths. And bound from head to foot in those cloths, he came stumbling out like a little mummy. Jesus said, unbind him, let him go. Why would he say that? Because he's not dead anymore. Yeah. He's alive. Take off those grave clothes and let him go. That, that just preaches good. That's a picture of you and me. You were dead in sin. And, and we need to take off that old lifestyle, that old life. You were dead, wrapped up like a little mummy in your sins. And now you're born again, and Jesus says, unbind him and let him go. Now we're alive in Christ. We're alive in Christ. You're not dead anymore. So walk that way. Then we read our verse here in Romans 13, 14. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Make no provision for the flesh. That's, that's the further application of the gospel. We were baptized into Christ and have put on Christ. Now we're to, uh, to put on Christ in our daily practice, our daily walk. It's the way we live. Every day we're reapplying Christ to our lives. And that is our sanctification. So Galatians 3.27, once again, we were clothed with Christ's imputed righteousness when we first believed. Now Romans 13.14 says, put on Christ by walking in righteousness in your daily practice. We're constantly putting on Christ. What does that even mean? To put on Christ is to be, like the apostle says elsewhere, to be imitators of Christ. You're WWJD. Uh, <laughs> then he says, uh, make no provision for the flesh in regard to its lust. So there's a story of the little boy. His mom can't find him. He's hiding in the pantry with his hand in the cookie jar. Mom's calling out for him, where are you, little Billy? She opens the door and sees him in there with his hand in the cookie jar. What are you doing? He says, I'm resisting temptation. <laughs> That's not the way to resist temptation, with your hand already in the jar. Sometimes we tempt the devil to tempt us. We put ourselves in situations that you're, you're setting yourself up for failure. Jesus said, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself, take up the cross, and follow me daily. And then Galatians 2.20, the apostle says, I've been crucified with Christ. And again, I can just see the apostle looking at his reflection in the water or in a mirror. 
preaching the gospel to himself, I've been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. I'm dying to self. The Bible tells us to abstain from fleshly lust. To make no provision for the flesh means that you need to say no to yourself. You need to learn to say, no, I'm not going to do that. It doesn't honor God. I, I'm living for the Lord. You kind of split a split personality in a way. There's a little bit that remains of your old nature, the, the, all that remains of wickedness, James says, but now you're a new creature in Christ. And you're trying to stomp out those old remnants. We just have to tell them no. In Galatians 5.17, it says, The flesh sets its desire against the spirit, the spirit against the flesh. These two are in opposition to one another so that you may not do what you want. You there, you may not do what you want, is your old flesh, the remnants of that. I've given you this analogy. This is just good stuff. This is a true story, by the way. Missionary led a, an old chief to, I, I guess we're supposed to say Native American now. Uh, a Native American chief uh, was led to the Lord by this missionary. Missionary comes back through the tribe years later to talk to the old chief. And the chief said this, I have two dogs living in my body that are always fighting. And the missionary said, well, which, which dog is winning? And, and this chief says, the dog that I feed the most always wins. That's just good stuff. If you feed your flesh, those little sins are going to get stronger. But every time that you say no, you deny that sinful lust, it gets a little weaker. It works both ways. It's getting stronger or weaker depending upon whether you're feeding it or starving it. And so we have to do that. And you do it because you love the Lord. There are little pet sins that people like to hold on to, and, and they seem like they're socially acceptable sins. You know, pride, everybody. We tell our kids, you know, I'm so proud of you, and um, we even cultivate pride in our culture. But um, pride is a, it's the sin that stumbled the, the devil. And all such sins, there are no acceptable sins. And if we feed those, they'll grow, these little pet sins that seem so cute. Isn't so, it's so cute the way she, you know, curses when she stubs her toe? No, not really. <laughs> because those things, if nurtured, will grow into something ugly, life-dominating sins. So we're to make no provision for the flesh by dying daily and denying ourselves. Don't put yourself in compromising situations. Listen, if you are an alcoholic or were, then uh, what do you, <laughs> you shouldn't go to a bar. Dwight L. Moody used to go to bars to witness to people and lead them to Christ. He, he never had a problem with alcohol. But a person who was an alcoholic probably shouldn't do that. If you have a problem with lustful thoughts, immoral thoughts, it would be a good idea for you not to have your computer set up in a private place where you're all by yourself looking at it. You know yourself better than that. Don't set yourself up for failure. Put it in the middle of a family room or only look at it when others are around. Don't feed pet sins or they will grow. Learn to say no to yourself. And, and listen, we can't do any of this without the grace of God. We're crying out to God. I know what I need to do, Lord. You've, you've spilled that out in your word, but I don't have the power to do these things. Lord, help me. I am weak, but you are strong. That's it. So let's answer our questions. To what are these verses referring when they admonish us to wake up? It's to wake up from spiritual slumber in your Bible reading, your prayer, church attendance, outreach, all those things. Is the apostle addressing unbelievers when he says that salvation is near? No. It's written to God's people to live in readiness to stand before Jesus. Live right now for Christ. Each day. We're capturing every thought, every activity, every word. 
We want so much to glorify the Lord in all these things. We have to be intentional about th thinking this because it's not natural, is it? And then we're called to be imitators of Christ. That's what it means to put on Jesus Christ, to be imitators of Christ, to become more and more Christ-like. Hey, how about people that knew you, if you were saved later in life like me, um, if, if you saw that ran into some of the, your old um, people that you used to run with back in the day, would they look at you and say, what happened to you? You used to be the ringleader in our little posse of, <laughs> of bad behavior. Yeah. I hope they could see a difference in you and me. But we're not doing it for them. We're doing it for the Lord. All right. Let's stand in prayer. Worship team's going to stay where they're at. And we're going to close off in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word, which is a light and lamp to our feet. I know I uh, sure need to hear these words. I pray, Lord, that you would grow us up in our faith. Help us not to remain as little children. Help us, because I know you're more interested in these things even than we are in our greatest moment of devotion. Lord, help us to put on Jesus Christ his truth and his righteousness, his holiness, those communicable attributes we talked about last week, oh Lord. How I want to be like you, Lord, is our cry. Help us to do that, dear God, for your name's sake, for your fame in the earth. We pray that you would work in the lives of your people, we pray in Jesus' name, amen.